first you want to cube it up so you have as much surface area as possible. You know, just get it as small. Some people even put it through a grinder mm -hmm. so that it gets really fine and then they start melting it down from there. But I just kind of get it into one inch chunks or so and stick it in. But we're way ahead of ourselves. So do you separate your lard then from the belly to the... I do. I generally do the leaf lard for pastries and the fat back that I render I use for frying. But if I'm in a pinch and I need a biscuit, you know, I'll use whatever. <laughs> Before we actually dive in, I was going to talk about equipment and safety, everyone's favorite topic. This is a scimitar. You can use this interchangeably with a breaking knife, which we don't happen to have, but those are the ones that look like a pirate knife. They're like straight and then they curve just at the end. Um, I prefer a scimitar for some reason, maybe just because I've used it more. Good brands are like Dexter, Wusthof, Messermeister. This is a Wusthof boning knife. This is a nice boning knife because it's semi-flexible, which is good for getting around joints and boning out stuff. I have a Messermeister boning knife that's really stiff and it's not my favorite. It's too bad it cost me as much as it did. This is a cleaver, Dexter's the best. It's got good weight to it. You guys are welcome to handle these, just don't cut yourself. You don't always have to use a cleaver. This is like for knocking off um, rib chops and stuff. You can use it in conjunction with the rubber mallet. You can also just use a bone saw. And we have two here. This is a nice, I think this is a 19 inch, maybe 16 inch bone saw. This is a 25 inch breaker. I just like to have them big so that you can do whatever you need to do with it. We have each here and people can practice. This is just a stainless honing steel, but they make diamond encrusted ones um, just for keeping your blade up to speed. And then for sharpening, you can either send your knives off or get stones. I use water stones, but they also make oil stones. It takes a little bit of practice to get the hang of it, but once you do, it's a great way to keep your blade sharp without wrecking it. A lot of the pull-throughs and the electric sharpeners will just wreck your blade. Hand sharpening, I think, is the best way to go. And unfortunately, there's not a place that I know of, maybe you guys know of a place around here that does sharpening for people, like quality on a grinder or a stone. I know a few of the newer butcher shops they're starting to incorporate that into their model, which I think is super awesome, because that's how it used to happen in the old days. My friends up in Norfolk have a butcher shop called Pendulum, and they're doing knife sharpening for people, which is really great. Um, but I don't think anybody around here does it. Did you already talk about the pig that we're working with today? The individual? Yeah. A little bit. Or what breed it we're, is? We reminisced a little. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a Duroc Berkshire. Today, and a Duroc is a breed out of the Midwest for hardiness, and this one is a cross between the two. Duroc is known for breeding, good breeding, right? Good mothering? Uh, Duroc mothers are supposed to be real uh -huh. and have that good mothering ability and desire. So you can see I'm doing a lot of this with my hands. That's something I like to talk about a lot when I'm doing butchery is you'll do a lot more with your hands than you think you can. Finding seams, ripping things when you can without destroying the muscles. This is all leaf lard, which is amazing. This is an amazing amount. And the leaf lard, just, the reason it's called that, it's differentiated from the fat back because it's the fat that surrounds the organs. And it has a different quality. And I was passing some of it around. If you guys want to get your hands dirty, go ahead. That's some leaf lard. And you can tell it's like squishier and mushier. It's more velvety, if you will. I don't know, all pig fat's pretty velvety. But if you touch the fat back, it's a lot denser and harder than the leaf lard. And that's why it kind of creates a different product when you render it down. In terms of safety, the knives are sharp. You want to keep them sharp. Obviously, don't ever cut towards yourself if you can avoid it. Sometimes you'll have to. Knife grip is mostly what I talk about when I'm talking about safety. There's three main proper grips. There is the pinch grip, which you probably use in your kitchen a lot with your chef knife. It's where you're pinching it right here. You're not holding just the handle. That's bad for your wrist. You want to get it right here at the heel of the blade. And that's what you use a lot for like pushing down and pulling through. Um, there's the dagger grip, the psycho grip, if you will. And that's for like breaking through large pieces of meat. And then there is the thumb grip, which is grasping the knife like this with your thumb over the spine. Not everybody uses proper grips all the time, myself included. You'll just find yourself getting into habits, but this is often seen and it's really not good because it can create bone spurs and arthritis over time. I always say don't butcher in your chacos. You need to have closed toed shoes on. I can't even tell you how many times like I've moved an animal and like a cleaver will just come falling off the table. And it's not really a matter of if you're gonna cut yourself, it's about when you're gonna cut yourself. I have no feeling in my left middle finger. I have a friend who's missing a finger. One of my heroes actually completely 
like stabbed himself in the wrist and has his entire career has been completely affected by it. And this is like a super duper professional person. So the first process of breaking any animal down is breaking it from the hole into primals. When this guy went in, I imagine he was stunned and then cut, his throat was cut after he went up on the rail and he was bled out. And then at the slaughterhouse, they, they cut him down the spine, right down the center to get it into two halves. Obviously, we're just working with half today because you know what to do with one half, then you know what to do with the other half. The primals on a hog are the shoulder primal, which is everything between the fourth and fifth rib and above. Um, then you have the loin, which is back meat, the belly, which is self-explanatory, and then you have the ham, um, which is everything. Really, some people differentiate the saddle section, which is the kind of the belly below the 13th rib, but really for all intents and purposes, there are only four primals. So it's the loin, belly, shoulder, and ham. And from there you get down into subprimals and then retail cuts. So the first thing we're gonna do is split the shoulder off. And the way we do that is we split between the fourth and fifth rib. Sometimes you have to feel around for the first rib because it can be covered with blood or fat or skin. So it's actually right here and you can just feel it's, it's hard. So I'm gonna count one, two, three, four. And then with my boning knife, I've already gone ahead and marked in between four and five. One of the basic rules is you only saw through bone. You use your knife for meat. So I went as far as I could with my knife, but I'm hitting the scapula or the shoulder blade. So I'm gonna have to stop there. Right here is my breastplate or rib tips. And then obviously the chine or spine is right here. So Rocco is gonna the saw through. Is the, the breastplate is like the sternum, yeah. Just follow the angle of the ribs and... Are you? Yup. And the technique with sawing is to basically just lightly make your mark and then without too much pressure, follow through. If you, with bone saws, if you try to put too much downward pressure, it's just gonna bind up. There you go. All right. There it is. Yep. And so we'll, cool, I just I felt that. Sorry. So if you continue down with the knife, We'll get as far as we can, and then Rock will have to come back in and cut through the scapula. Some people use a scimitar for this. You can do that too. Maybe you can hit up the scapula now. Yeah, I think that's where I'm at. You might get the smaller saw for that. One thing that helps sometimes is to turn the animal up if you wanna try that for getting through oh, the scapula. Yep. I think we're through. Okay, let's just go ahead and split the whole thing into primals then. As I'm going, I'm keeping, like I wanna keep leaf larvae separate from fat back, and then if I have extra stuff like I goofed on my cut there, I'm just gonna put it aside for trim. So the next cut is gonna be pretty similar to that one where we're gonna use both knife and saw. We're gonna split between the 13th and the 14th rib to separate the loin and belly from the ham section. So. We have five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And anytime you're breaking an animal, you'll find whether it's a cow or a lamb or a pig, the last rib is always left on the back section, just so you don't damage the tenderloin. Um, and also because that's where kind of the muscles start changing um, between this section of the loin, the rack and the strip loin. Um, and it's confusing, people talking about loin, loin this, loin that. A lot of people, when they hear loin, they just think tenderloin. But the loin is all the back meat. If we were talking about humans, the loin would be all the meat that goes along your vertebrae. Same question. Yeah. I notice you're cutting this at a particular angle. I follow the angle of the ribs. There is a right way to do it, like fourth and fifth rib, 13th and 14th rib, but there's a million different ways to do it. And so... And we'll talk about some of the different options as we get into the primal, um, like what our different options are for the end cuts that we're gonna come up with. There 
you. Um, so the, uh, the strip one, I guess, would be the most proper term for this section. Um, it looks like there's a little bit of damage on the ham side of this guy right here. I'm not sure what happened, but it'll be all right. Okay, so here we have rib and belly. We'll deal with in a minute. And then our next job will be to take the ham. So the loin is differentiated from the tenderloin. That's what I was saying earlier. The loin is the back meat, the tenderloin is underneath the back meat between the very last rib and the hip bone. So your, this is your strip loin from here to your hip. And your rack is obviously under your rib cage, the loin meat that's under your rib cage. Um, the sirloin on any animal is all the meat between the pelvic bone and the H bone or the hip bones. So it's gonna be like right here. So the sirloin, this is the H bone this guy. And so when we're gonna split the ham, which we might wait to do because I'm gonna probably pull the butt of the tenderloin out so I don't cut through it later. But um, we'll split right above the H bone to get the ham off of the saddle section. But for now, we'll move this aside. So the tenderloin is kind of internal. Oh yeah, and that's why it's tender because the general principle is that the muscles the animal uses the most are gonna be the most succulent, they have the most flavor, but they're gonna be tougher. Animals, the muscles the animal uses the least are gonna be the most tender. So the, ten, the tenderloin hardly ever gets used. That's why it's so tender, but it doesn't really taste like very much. Um, I used to own a butcher shop and we were gonna make a t-shirt that says the shoulder is the butt because it's like an ongoing joke. Or sometimes you'll go to a restaurant and, and you'll be like, oh, pork sandwich, what cut is that made from? They'll be like, you're like, is that the shoulder? They're like, actually, I think it's the butt. But the butt is the shoulder. The shoulder is split into two subprimals, the picnic, which is everything below the chine, and the Boston butt, which is the chine and above. The chine, and is, the the chine is spine, chine spine. is spine. What's really interesting about pork shoulder, and especially the butt section, is that naturally it contains an almost perfect ratio of lean to fat for making sausage. So a lot of people create ground pork or sausage from the butt section. Um, so I was gonna go through a few options one option here would be to remove the breastplate, which is down here, and then take off the neck bones, which we've already had removed for us, so we don't really have to worry about that. Actually, no, we could remove bones here, and we would have just like a semi-boneless shoulder section for roasting. The next option, which we're gonna do, I think, is um, we're gonna <laughs> split right under the chine, and we're gonna separate the Boston butt from the picnic. I'm gonna go ahead and make my mark. So the Boston butt, is that a special cut of the butt? That no, the Boston butt is the subprimal of the shoulder, everything from the chine and above. So that's the Boston butt. It's completely bone in when I take it off of here. And then there's different things you can do with it, which we'll talk about when we get there. Um, but basically. Boston butt, butt in the change of the term. Yeah, pork butt, Boston butt. And I heard it's from like the butt of a rifle, like where you hold a rifle and the butt hits your shoulder and that's where it originates. What I'm sawing through right now is the country ribs. Y'all like country ribs? There she glows. Skin on this puppy is thick. Maybe some good old chicharrones there. All right. So here we have our picnic and our Boston butt. And so I think what we're gonna use the butt for is we're gonna make some copa or capicola, um, which is a dry cured, whole, it's like a salami, but it's made with whole muscle, it's not ground. So what we're gonna do is probably take the chine out, which will take a bit of sawing, probably from this direction at an angle. Um, and skin it. And then we'll just trim it up into like squares of, of meat and then we're gonna probably season it. Um, sugar, coriander, garlic, mace, juniper, allspice. Those are kind of typical um, capicola seasonings. And then we'll probably cure it in the refrigerator for nine days, rub it again, cure it for nine more days, stuff it in a beef casing and then let it hang 
um, about 12 hours, and then we're going to let it under refrigeration, and then we'll let it dry three to four weeks at 60 degrees, 60 to 70 percent humidity. Um, then we'll have copa. So this is the picnic, and what I can do here is undercut the country ribs anytime. And you can leave more meat on this on them than I am. Obviously, you want to rub them down and smoke them, but I'm just sort of showing. We'll take these off, and there's a bunch of glandular stuff that will trim off. That's the short ribs, you say? Country ribs. Country ribs. Mm -hmm. I mean, what makes the difference between those ribs and your other ribs? It's kind of like rib tips. It's like on the tip of the breastplate. So, like if they were, if this is a lamb, they'd be called Denver ribs. You know, it just kind of depends on the animal, but. I mean, the bulk of the rib cage is right here. So when you're talking about beef short ribs, you're talking about, and there's all kinds of different technicalities to beef short ribs, like which section they come from, how long they are, you know. Um, but they usually come from this section. Baby back ribs just come from smaller ribs. Baby back ribs come, no, they come, they have more meat on them and they come from up here. The spare ribs are gonna be down here. Like when we split the rack from the belly, you'll see the, the spare ribs are gonna be the lower ribs. The baby back ribs would be like if I chose to, to take this upper rack and take the bones out with a good bit of meat on the back and the, this would be baby back ribs. Ribs from the loin area that have been like butterflied and then cut in between each rib chop and it's like a boneless cut, like country style rib cut or something. There's our country ribs. And we'll peel, we'll, before prepping, we'll go back and take off glands. Um, probably won't trim a lot of fat off of it, but if we find like sinew on here, we'll pull it off. We'll pull this off. That's a bunch of glandular stuff. That's a bad knife angle, but anyways, there we go. So what we can do with this, and I think what we will do with the picnic is uh, trim it up for sausage. Yeah. And I'm gonna skip it right now because I, I just don't wanna go over time with the rest of the pig, but if you're gonna bone it out, you find, you'll wanna reach in here and find, see, I could have left all that meat on there for the, country ribs, but you want to find the ball joint, and this is all kind of fatty tissue right here, so I can reach in and try to find the ball joint where the, I guess it's the humerus, goes into the scapula, and it's pretty much right there in the center, and I can take and make a cut straight back. Here's the scapula, so I'm going to take and make a cut straight back. So you almost need to decide what you're going to do with all these different cuts of meat before you start cutting it up. Kind of. Yeah, and that's what I did. Like last night I sat down and made a pig plan. I was like, here's what we're going to do with this half a pig, you know. And I mean, you can change your plan. Like I could, I could be boning this out for Trim and be like, you know what, actually I want to make a tied boneless picnic ham, you know. Or I want to make it semi-boneless. I'm going to leave the humerus in and I'm going to take the scapula out and I'm going to roast it, you know, that way. So what I would do if I was going to bone this out was I would go in make my cut, and I don't know if you can see what I've done is I've just gone, pretty much anytime you're boning out something, you just wanna create a line right on top of the bone so that you can see the top of the bone and then just start peeling the meat back from either side of it. Or in this case of the scapula, we're gonna go pull the top flap off, go under it, pull it out. And then if we wanted to take the humerus out, we would continue our line down on top of the humerus bone and then carve out around it. And we can maybe do practice with that. We could also take the shank off which would be another different cut to use. Um, like if I was gonna do this for, for sausage, I probably wouldn't put the shank meat in sausage. I would probably skin this, leave the bone in, and like braise it or something. I love braised pork shank. It's one of the best, the best things. Um, but we'll move on to the rack and belly. One of the things I could have done, which I did with the other half of this hog, was take off all the flat meat. Um, so this is like the pork skirt steak or flat meat, and you can see, you can't see from where you are. You can see where the muscles are and where the fat is. So I would just go under that muscle and pull it off. But I think I'm gonna leave it on the belly. And if you leave it on, it just becomes part of your bacon, right? So more meat on your bacon. And since this is a super fatty hog, I think leaving more meat on the, on the belly is a good idea. You know? Thank you. That's like the thing I don't want to happen is that knife to turn around on me. So for separating, there's a couple options with this. If I wanted to um, make a, like a Frenched rack, I could keep all this on here and I would cut 
you know what a French track is, right? It's like the big rack with like the bone sticking out of it. So I could come down here and I could make like a pretty hard cut down the center of the rib bone all the way to the end. And then basically what you would do is peel. This is all sinew that's right on top of the bones. So you would peel starting at the very first bone and getting it completely off the tips of the bones, peel it back, and I'm not gonna do it because we're gonna actually cut bone and pork chops, but you see the rib bone coming out there? And I might wanna cut, if I was doing this, I would probably wanna cut through the cartilage a little bit so that I could actually free the rib bone up from the, rib, from the feather bones. And then I would go and separate the sinew off from each bone and pull it back. And then if you're really good, you can take your finger and curve it around the back of the rib bone at that point and just like French all the sinew down until you stop. And that, what you'll end up with is your big old rack with the bone sticking out and then you go under the bones and you cut off the belly. Um, so that's one option. We are, for, the, for our dinner that we're doing, I guess we did split it for the dinner. For the dinner we're doing, a, in, we're doing a roast, a roasted rack of ribs, and so we split it, which is what I'm gonna do right now, I think. If you did French this out, and it was like a rack with the bone sticking out, you could cut tomahawk rib chops, which are super cool. They have like the bone sticking out everywhere. Should have brought that whole beast book with pictures. But anyways, for splitting the rack from the belly, the technique is measuring the eye of the loin, which is, it's hard to see on the shoulder side. The eye of the loin is this. So I'm measuring it with my knife. And it's, you know, pretty much the length of my knife, but then I wanna take half, so I'll mark that. Then I wanna take half of that length, and that is gonna tell me where to split. You don't have to follow that rule. You can do whatever you want. If you want more meat on your belly, you can split it up higher. But there is like this special little spot, kinda of right here, you can see it's kind of like a triangle. And that is where like a lot of caramelization happens and a lot of really good flavor happens when you have a bone in chop. So that's why a lot of people use that measurement technique to get plenty of meat on the rack. So we'll make a mark. Usually when the table's wrapped like this, the board doesn't slide so much. And some people um, mark like this and then flip it over to saw, but you can also saw from the rib side just to get through the bones and then cut through with your scimitar or breaking knife. So this is like your money cut, right? If you're raising pigs, and that's something that we can talk about more, like pricing the animal based on the cost of production, but obviously not all cuts are created equal. So your loin cuts here are gonna be your most valuable cuts. Let's say you need to get an average of $4 a pound for this hog, that means your loin cuts are gonna average about $8 a pound and then your fat's gonna be like $2 a pound and that's gonna get you to the right price point. So you can see I use the dagger grip a lot when I'm pulling through meat and I use the pinch grip when I'm pushing down. So what we have here is a pork rack, but I think what we'll do is, a lot of this fat's probably gonna come off of this bad boy because he's got a lot. But one of the things I love to do, what we would do at the shop is leave all the fat on and the skin. Because the skin on bone in pork chop is about one of the best things in the world when the skin gets really crispy. So what we would do is we would just cut, and what you do to cut in your bone and chops is you just go in between each rib and cut your chop, and you'll have to bust through the chine. Obviously you can do it with a saw or you can do it with your mallet and your cleaver. So we'll have Rocco start doing that. And then at the shop, we would cut them just like this. And if people wanted less fat or no skin or whatever, we'd always cut it down from there. Um, so. so if you wanted your loin out of that. Well, people don't usually bone out that for boneless pork chops. They'll, bo they'll bone out the strip loin, which is right here. So These are rib out, chops. So when you go in and buy a loin, Pork like a pork loin roast. It's usually the strip loin. It's going to be they pulled out the tenderloin and then they boned out the chine. And this meat, this loin meat right here, goes all the way back. And that's your boneless. So if you hear double cut chops, that's when they take two ribs. And they go every two ribs for a thicker cut. 
So what I'm gonna do here, I have now the spare ribs, which are the ribs that ride on, ride on top of the belly. And I'm gonna pull the spare ribs off so that I just have a big old slab of belly that we can cure for bacon. Um, and how would you cure that at home? Well, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can do a dry cure, you can do a wet brine. Um, I prefer dry cured bacon. It takes longer to cure that way. Rocco, what'd you put in? Uh, Rocco's doing a wet brine right now off the other half. What'd you put in there? Just. Uh, no, wet brine for the bacon. Mm -hmm. um, I put in <clears throat> bay leaves, mm -hmm. some pepper, uh, some maple syrup, some red pepper, Peppercorns, um, and then with water, like, I'm missing it. Salt? Salt and sugar? <laughs> yeah, salt and sugar, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then I feel like I'm missing another aromatic, like maybe a little dash of cloves or something with the bay, bay leaves, uh, like that. <clears throat> and boil that just to when it was boiling and let it cool, and it's in the refrigerator, and making sure that it's covered. Um, which mine isn't, so I'm just flipping it. Yeah, you want either way, even if it's covered, you want to overhaul it or flip it over. Some people do it every day. Like Benton's Bacon, a real famous bacon place in East Tennessee, they flip every day. And they brine for like a really long time, like 30 days or something. Um, at the shop, we did a wet brine, and we brine for like, we would brine for maybe two, three, four days. That's it, before we would smoke it. But I mean, obviously, the longer it brines, like the more salt and flavor it's going to soak up. Um, salt to water ratio. How can you make it not so salty and still make sure it's okay to eat? There are recipes for master brine. A cup of salt to a gallon of water and then half a cup of sugar. But sometimes you want things to be more sweet. So you might make it one to one. Or I've even seen brines that are reverse of that. Like half salt to whole sugar, whole part sugar. And that's going to cure it without, so you don't have any spoilage or poison or... Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Generally, but you can use cure number one on bacon, which is sodium nitrite. Yeah. Um, but if you don't want to use that, what do you use? You can just do sugar and salt. You can do celery juice powder. The thing about celery juice powder, and I mean, this is kind of a soapbox, or it can be seen as a soapbox. Nobody really knows how much celery juice powder to use in order to make something properly cured. Um, whereas sodium nitrite has been studied, and we know how much to add. Nitrates are naturally occurring. so. If I use one tablespoon of sodium nitrite in a brine, by the time I eat a couple slices of bacon for breakfast, that's less nitrate than I'm going to get from a you know, thing of celery. Yeah, I mean, celery has it, spinach has it, a lot of dark leafy greens have it, especially if they don't get optimum sun. We have done bacon at the shop with celery juice powder or maple, like without sugar, without nitrite. Um, but I don't think it tastes as good, quite frankly, you know. Brown sugar or white sugar? I like brown, but you can use whatever. Some people use white sugar and then add molasses or something, which is basically the same thing as having a brown sugar. What do you sugar. do the dry cure? The dry cure is just sugar, salt, and spices. Don't put it in a bowl with a bunch of salt so all the moisture can come out and it can sit in that moisture and kind of elevate it and have some separation. Keep your container mm -hmm. dry. Also have to be refrigerated, I presume? Yeah, definitely. And then after it's cured, smoke it. And you got and you bacon. Would, and you would turn it and re-rub it and periodically. Yeah, and then before you smoke it, you want to rinse it. That's another thing. No matter whether you've done a wet brine mm -hmm. or a dry brine. Just smoke it on smoke a normal smoker or just. Yeah, heck yeah. Um, and people always ask me, how long do you smoke that? How long do you smoke that? And I say, till it's done. You know, how do you know it's done? You take smoke the temperature. <laughs> when it gets to 140, it's done, you know, but there's no prescribed time. It depends on the thickness of the belly. That's the same for the cure. Like if you cure a really tiny, thin little belly, for the same amount of time that you occur a thickness, it's going to be too salty, you know? So you kind of learn as you go. And if you have standard, finally, good gracious. If you have a standard size that you're working with, here's my spare ribs. Spare. And what would, how would you dress those up? I love, one of my favorite recipes is like a sesame spare ribs. And I don't marinate them at all. I just make like a sesame sauce with like cornstarch and water and sesame oil and a little bit of sugar. And I just cook them down you know, over and over again, and that, like, reduce them, and they're super good. Just, um, you know. A lot of people rub them, like, same with country ribs, like, rub them down, and smoke, marinate them, and then smoke them. Smoke. Yeah, or grill, you could grill them. Yeah. But the grillers are the baby backs. So this is the plate. 
Another thing you can do with this is make pancetta. And the difference between pancetta and bacon is that bacon is cooked. Pancetta is not. Pancetta is dry cured. Pancetta is usually cured and then rolled and hung. A lot of people nowadays are curing their pancetta flat because they think it keeps it more even. There's a specific like spice mix that goes on it. And I'm not, maybe somebody else with more history with pancetta. I usually just make bacon because I like bacon. Um, if you guys are ever down in Greenville, South Carolina is this cool place called Bacon Brothers Public House, if you've ever heard of it. They're doing some really awesome stuff on the commercial scale with charcuterie. And they're curing their pancetta flat. And they have these like huge old bellies that just have stuff rubbed on them and they're inside this cure chamber. These are the feather bones that I'm taking out. And you might have heard this term before. Um, it's super cool, they actually are like feathers. So at the tip of the ribs, there's like these little bones that come out that look like chicken feathers. And that's what I'm pulling out from under the, the flap here. Because I'm pretty, what I'm doing is just completely and totally boning out this belly so that we can make bacon. Um, if I had Frenched out that rack, I would have ended up with some rib meat that came off the back of the ribs and the belly. And you can cut like boneless short ribs, if you will, you know, out of like belly meat and rib meat that are like thin strips. You can braise them. That would be super yummy and creative. Um, do you have to cut your bacon with a saw or how do you cut thin strips from your bacon? I usually par freeze it and just slice it with a knife. Once it's par frozen, you can slice it thin pretty easily. And like with pieces like this, I'll trim through it. You know, that's good lean and good fat for making sausage. We don't have time to do that right now, but I'll just take this off so it looks nice and pretty. So there's our belly. That's another thing too, is that it's, it's much easier to skin it once it's been smoked. So you can just cure it skin on and smoke it and then just get your tip up and you can rip it right off. You know? So we're gonna have some bone in, skin on, really fatty rib chops in a minute when <laughs> um, Rocco gets through there. And the only thing to remember is only saw through bone and then when you're going in with your scimitar to cut the chops, just try to make as clean a cut as you possibly can so they don't have a ragged edge. All right, so what I'm gonna do with this probably is I'm gonna go in and this is like the fattest pig I've ever seen. Um, why, why can't you cut the whole thing through the bone? Well, I can, but the butt of my tenderloin's right here, and I don't really want to cut through the tenderloin. No, I'm sorry, I was talking about the saw, and you're just cutting through rather than, can't you cut the whole piece with the saw like you do in a butcher shop, they run it through the saw. And the band saw? Well, the blades on those things are really just for bone, and also you're going to end up with, if you go through the bone with your saw and then you keep going through it with a knife, you're going to have a lot more bone dust like all throughout the meat. So if you just hit the bone with the saw, and they get your knife to go through the meat. And you can see where we sawed through some of these guys, there's like bone dust all over the edges. And what I do is just go in with a damp rag and wipe it down really good. You can get a tool called a bone duster that'll scrape the bone off it. You know, it just depends on how much money you have to spend on your tools. Yeah, they're gonna be awesome. Yes. Most of the times you buy chops, they're not that thick. Was that from a smaller pig? Smaller pig and also just like the way our culture is, like we become afraid of fat, and so they trim them down well, a lot. I don't mean fat that way, I mean thick. Oh, They're thick. Stick. I mean, these are the yeah. whole ones. Yeah. Like a watermelon <laughs> But I mean, these other ones are gonna be pretty That's thick there, too. Right? That's a yeah. Chop. Yeah, it's a thick chop. But also it could be like, maybe when I was cutting in between the shoulder and the rack, like I left more meat on this side of the rib, so it wasn't like right up against that rib. We'll cut some more and we'll take a look oh, at them. Oh, the bone saw actually. Can you cut that in half if you wanted to? You can. You might be thinking about boneless pork chops too, which come from the boneless strip loin. And since there's no bone in it, they're not using the rib to determine. They can cut yeah. them as small as possible um, or small as they want. I was thinking we would leave the tenderloin in and cut porterhouse, pork, uh, pork porterhouse steaks, which is basically the strip loin and the tenderloin and the bone. Another option that you could do is pull the whole tenderloin out and have a boneless pork tenderloin. Then you can take out the chine and have a boneless strip What's loin. The chine? chine is the spine. Spine. Just follow the bone and take the bone out, and then I would cut boneless pork chops from here. Um, you can also cut steaks from the tenderloin, making tenderloin medallions. You can do whatever you want. And then this meat, this is cool, the saddle belly, which is basically the belly from it's like a flank on a cow. It's like the flank area. So it's the belly below the rib cage and down to the hip bone, the lower belly. 
Um, you can make more bacon out of it. This is really, this is actually a little bit better. The other day it was like just pure fat. Down here it was really, really fatty. So I was thinking um, that what we might do with this saddle belly is make chicharrones, which is like a pork skin, like a fried pork skin. fried pork skin. And I met this guy from the Dominican who gave me the best recipe ever. They actually leave the meat on, just like they would take the piece like it was taken for bacon with the meat and the fat on, and then they cut it skin on into strips, and then they dust it with baking soda. I don't know why. And then they just stick them all in a pan and cook them down in their own fat and fry them up like high heat in their own fat until they cook down. And it's like the best thing <laughs> in the world. It's like pork fried chicken, you know? And at the shop, we used to um, cook them down like that and then chop them up and like put them on tacos or sandwiches, you know, like, it, man, it's good. What's it called? How do you say it, Lisa? Chicharrones. 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 Yeah. That's C-H-I-C-H-A-R-O-N-E. Yeah. No matter what you want to do with the tenderloin, is when you go to split your saddle and strip loin from your ham, to try and free up the butt end of the tenderloin that's back here and lift it up before you saw above the H bone. And one way to do that, instead of going in and around the tenderloin if you're nervous about that, is to yeah, flip this over or up. And you can try to follow the leg, like take and start on your saddle and try to follow the line of the leg all the way down to here and then free, free up your entire saddle portion. But one thing you have to be careful about that is not cutting into the sirloin when you do that. Watch your finger. So one of the things we did with the other half is we just took the saddle belly and we skinned it and we took all the flat meat off, cooked the flat meat for dinner and just gave this to a friend to make lard with because it was just so, so fatty. And this, would you call all that leaf lard? It's not the fat bag. No, yeah, this is leaf lard down here. It's, it's yeah. just inside you the can skin. Just tell. Yeah, I mean, it's going to, there's going to be some really pliable fat down here. I guess is not technically leaf lard, but it all has that really pliable quality, you know? Mm -hmm. I guess this is technically not leaf lard. It's not lining organs. It's like lining muscles. Yeah. So if we're taking out the tenderloin... I'm just going to, and again, I don't really want to take it out here. I'm just trying to find the edge of it. Some of you can see, some of you can't. But basically what I'm doing is just taking my knife and scraping the flat meat, the top of the flat meat, and trying to cheat under the tenderloin. Because all it does is just ride up under the rib, the chine. So you want to slowly roll it out. And as you roll out, just cut underneath it. And again, I'm not actually gonna do it because I wanna cut porterhouses, but I wanna take out the end of it. And you can really tell, once you get out under this fat, you can tell the tenderloin because it just has really long. This is the tenderloin. Yeah, this is the tenderloin. You can tell it just has really lean, long muscle grain. And I just kind of made a decision there about where to stop, but I can kind of see the muscle changing quality, right. you know? So that's how I know that like, I'm sort of out of my tenderloin area and I'm getting into my sirloin. Um, and so by doing that, I've made myself a little bit of a mark for where I want to split the ham from the strip loin. It's interesting, on a deer, there's actually almost this white tissue that's like a... Divide. Really? Yeah. That's so nice like and handy. clean cut, you know, this is where it kind of yeah. starts. Yeah. Well, you can also kind of look at the, um, the vertebrae. Some people do, like, where it starts to kind of curve down oh, into okay. hip. I mostly use the H bone as my mark, you know. H bone and hip bone. H bone and hip bone are pretty much the same thing. Here's your ham. With this ham, we're going to do an air dried ham, which I'm really excited about. And what we'll do is I'll take the H bone out but leave the rest of the bones in. And then we'll salt it really thoroughly for a few, few days. Oh yeah, like cover. It has to be like completely submerged or completely covered. And then every time like you leave it, if there's salt falls off, you wanna like pack more salt on top of it. And one day per pound to salt it, they say. And then keep it in the fridge. 
and then you rinse it and you dry it and then every part that's exposed doesn't have skin on it, you would like smear it with lard that you had rendered and then put pepper on top of it, it kind of seals. And then wrap the whole thing up in like cheesecloth or a really thin pillowcase and hang it for like a year. Um, and I made one in my closet one time. It worked out fun. You want it to be dark. Right. Right. You want it to be about like room temperature right. with like sixty to seventy percent humidity. That's yeah. and there's a lot of variations you can do on that when you're dry curing meat. Like you can there's a good book called The Art of Fermenting Sausages, and it goes into all the different beneficial and detrimental bacteria and what their optimum temperature ranges are and which ones will survive below a certain temperature. And so if you were really advanced, you could really tweak that temperature and know that you're going to get these and not the other ones. But if you stay like that 60 to 62 degrees, 60 to 70% humidity is like where you want to get started because that's where most of the bad bacteria are going to die and most of the good bacteria are going to live, you know? Um, so that's that. What we'll do with this is take off the saddle belly. I'm just going to go right under the tenderloin, pretty much. I mean, you'll know if it's rotten, you know? It's gross. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. It's the bacteria that are in charge, it's not you. After you've hung it for a year, then it has to be washed and scrubbed. Mm -hmm. Well, the outer parts you might want to cut off. Some of them will get too funky for your liking. Um, but the inner parts should be like ready to go, thin sliced, you know? I mean, if it's, if it's dry, you can also squeeze it. And if it's like squishy, that's a bad sign. It should be firm, it should be drying out essentially. And you can find instructions online if you're electrically inclined, like you can go online and find a way to like get a refrigerator and like trick it out with a hygrometer. And I think I actually, um, split it wrong because I'm feeling another rib right there. I think I cut it accidentally between 12 and 13 and not 13 and 14 because that rib was hiding under a bunch of fat. Okay, so here's our bone-in strip loin and tenderloin still attached. And this would be the beef, you say that'd be? It'd be your New York strip and your tenderloin. But if you cut it this way, it'd be porterhouse? It'd be porterhouse. Mm -hmm. Tenderloin and the mm -hmm. loin. Yep. So this would be the filet mignon? Yep. This, the tenderloin is the filet mignon, yeah. And we'll keep it, I guess we'll keep it in there. I'm going to take this rib out. That would be your porterhouse chops. Porterhouse chops, yep. If you take out the tenderloin, then you'd have bone-in loin chops. And then if you take out the bone, you'd have boneless loin chops. And with any of these, you can leave the whole thing whole and bone in and like put some strings around it and call it a roast. A loin roast, what they have is like a section of the boned out loin that they're, you know, they usually cut into like three, four pound sections. So I'm making a tasso today. Show it to you. And this is actually not, this is not right. One of my favorite things to do is to take muscles that you don't usually use for a cure and use them in any way. Usually tasso is made with lo like a piece of loin from the strip loin. But what we did was we took a couple rib chops and boned them out. I rubbed them down four days ago. This has been sitting in my fridge for four days. We're gonna stick it in front of a fan here in a little bit and dry it real good for like two hours and then we're gonna smoke it until it's done. Um, it's gonna be real good. <laughs> um, we're serving it tomorrow. Huh? Yeah, we're serving it tomorrow. So there's the tasso in, pro in progress. Another thing, tasso, T-A-S-S-O. Yeah, the dinner is tomorrow night here. This is lardo that I'm making. Um, and all this is, is it's a big old piece of squared off fat back from the back of the rib that Rocco skinned and cut off. And I just covered it with salt and vacuum sealed it. And I'm gonna see it in about a year and cut it up. and laugh because it's so good. And do what? Eat it on crackers. <laughs> uh -uh. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's cured in salt. In salt. Yeah. You can cure anything in salt. I have a bunch of lemons in salt right now that have been in salt for like three months and they're super good. You just scrape all the pulp and seed out and then you just slice up the rind that's been cured in salt and put it in your greens or dress up a salad. Yeah, put your margarita. Impress your friends. 
So this saddle belly, I think we are gonna make chicharrones out of later. And this is our ham. Like I said, we are gonna make a, an air dried ham and the only thing that I'm gonna do in order to get ready for that is come under this H bone out. And I can feel through here, try and find the place where the was, femur comes in. the same as the pelvis? Uh-huh. Well, there's a pelvic bone and a hip bone. Hip I wish bone. I had like a... So hip bone is mm -hmm. like, is there, is there two separate ones? So you know when you see like a skeleton, the H bone would be like the big hip bone that has a hole in the middle, and then the pelvic bone would be the two bones that come up this way. So the pelvic bone technically is like long, and then the H bone is like wide so with a hole in the center. Right? So the meat in between those two is the sirloin on any animal. So like you'll, you can see here, like once we take the H bone off, or in between, this is the sirloin, in between the hip and the H bone. And a lot of times people will take this off skin it, smoke it, you can cut steaks out of it, but technically any cut that's from a muscle other than a loin is a cutlet, not a chop or a steak. So that, they would be sirloin cutlets. If you left the pelvic bone in, they would be bone-in sirloin cutlets. If you took the pelvic bone out, it would be boneless sirloin cutlets. Um, you can also trim the sirloin for grind. You can leave it on your ham if you're gonna dry it. Again, lots and lots of options. There's also a cut on, on beef that sits like right in the little hole area of the H bones called the spider. And you can take it out of a pig too if you want. It's a good little snack. It's just a flat round muscle that sits. And I compare everything to beef just because if you can understand the anatomy of a cow, you can understand the anatomy of anything. They have more complex muscles than any other animal. So if you're like looking at the pig and be like, oh, there's a tri-tip. Or oh, there's the mock tender, you know, and you can sort of start understanding from there. But the cow is by far the most difficult. And a lot of times you won't see like the beef spider and the pork spider, you know, anyone talking about it because usually it's just like if you're butchering, it's what you cook up and eat while you're working. And for taking stuff off a bone, you really just wanna use your knife to feel around and find the bone and then you wanna go, keep your knife as close to the bone as possible and keep it clean and take the meat out from around it. And the only thing I'm doing to this one is taking the H bone out which arguably is the hardest part of any breakdown. Should be able to now see the whole H-bone right there. You can easily sometimes get 25 pounds worth of ham, 25 to 30 pounds worth of shoulder and still get about 25 pounds worth of sausage. Like if you send it to the slaughterhouse, that should be like your ideal aim. 25 pounds, 25 pounds. 25 pounds of ham, 25 to 30 of shoulder, and then you can still get 25 pounds of sausage just, just from random shoulder. trim. There's like five to eight pounds of ribs, like 12 pounds of legs and trotters. It all adds up. I have a PowerPoint. I did a PowerPoint on like feed, feed issues and um, like feed conversion and what it costs to feed organically and why it's so hard for farmers to make that happen. And, mm -hmm. and so there was like, we did an average, like average carcass will yield thusly. And therefore you need to reckon on the following prices, you know, in order to make can we see that PowerPoint someplace? Yeah, OGS at Organic Grower School is the one that had me do it. And I think they're going to do a webinar with me. And then it'll be online with me talking. So you can actually understand it because it's just a lot of numbers on a slide right now. It's not there yet. It's not there yet. I'm happy to give you the presentation, but it's not, it's not, it's just a PowerPoint. You know what I mean? It's not like, basically I just took people through an enterprise budget for pork and for broiler poultry so that and it was for consumers. It was so consumers could see um, why it costs so much more for a loin chop from, like when they go to the grocery store and they see boneless pork chops for $6.99 a pound, and they go to the farmer's market and they see it for eight nine ninety nine a pound, and they're like, why are they cheaper? It's like, well, a pork chop is not a pork chop, it's not a pork chop anymore. It's, this is a commodity hog, you know, it's from a vertically integrated corporate business, you know, it was raised in a concrete pen. This is a family farm that's receiving no subsidies, not vertically integrated, had to pay to feed as well as slaughter that animal, as well as a bunch of non-feed costs. Then if that farmer starts feeding organic feed, which is easily, if it's certified organic, it's easily double the price of conventional feed. So we took, we took, we called all the feed mills and like, I think you can get non-GMO conventional feed for about $660 a ton. And let's say Southern States is going for like 320 a ton. So it's maybe double 
375 a ton. So maybe it's like a little bit less than double to go to conventional non-GMO. But then once you got to certified organic, it was like 975 a ton. And then you got your delivery fee on top of that. So we took it all the way through the enterprise budget and we said, okay, well, if farmer, called him Farmer Asheville, Farmer Asheville needs to make $4 a pound on his conventionally fed hog, he needs to make an average of $7 a pound on a non-GMO conventionally fed hog. And then he needs to make an average of like $10, $11 a pound on an organically fed hog. And what are our options? Because it's obviously not asking Farmer Asheville to like start his own feed mill and just eat all those costs, you know, like we have to do, we have to do more. So it was a pretty interesting class, you know, people were, people were surprised, you know. But having been a farmer myself, like one of my big gripes is like, we have to stop asking the farmer to do everything. You know, it's just impossible. We have to take some of that responsibility. So what I'm doing is just going behind the H-bone. What is the best ratio of fat to meat for making a good sausage? 80, no, 70, 30. 70 lean, 30 fat. Ground beef is 80, 20, sometimes 90, 10 for the less fattier types. So that's one of the things we tried to do with our butcher shop. You know, my personal story was we had a farm for 10, 12 years, and we decided, oh, we really we looked at all our numbers, and we realized we were paying 52% of our gross profits to the processor. So we said, oh, okay, what if we just pay the kill fee, get the hogs dressed and split, bring them back to the shop, and cut them ourselves? Granted, we'll have a bunch of extra operation, you know, overhead costs, but we'll gain back a lot of those processing costs. It's working to an extent, but... I have hope that something like that, like a farm with a sister business, will be able to help farmers see a little bit more profit, but not every farmer is going to be able to start a butcher shop. A lot of people seem to have a propensity for it. If you understand anatomy and you, um, if you kill deer, you're going to get it really quickly, you know? Mostly all animals are laid out the same. I mean, even like you can make a comparison to almost any muscle in an animal as you can to a human, you know? So we can talk about the sirloin being like this muscle or the loin being this muscle. And this is your flank and this is your belly. And the same with a cow, a deer, a pig, whatnot, you know. And it's, it's funny, like the lingo is weird. Like why say chine instead of spine? Why, you know, why do that? That's just the lingo, you know, every... And they have, for different animals, they have different names for the same cut. Yeah. And, all, and like it depends where you are in the world too. Like if you look up like a beef chart in Europe, as opposed to the United States, it's completely different. Not completely, but there's a lot, especially in like the hind section, they use a lot of different terminology for. If you didn't take the H bone out, how would you cut that? I don't know why you would leave the H bone in. Um, even for curing, it's just, it's just like a big old exposed bone, you know, which is, Bone actually, like, bone turns meat rancid, you know? So the more boneless something can be, it's gonna keep longer. Um, like, meat on meat's a bad idea, like in the fridge, unless it's vacuum sealed, you don't wanna stack meat on top of it itself, you know? Um, bone adds flavor, you know? So it's kind of a dance there. Even if I was gonna cut leg steaks, I would have to take the H bone out, so it's just this awkward, big bone that doesn't saw through. You can't cross cut it. It's just like, so what I'm doing right now is if you want to see, you can come up here. That's the, that's the joint, right? So that's where the femur comes into the H bone. And anytime you're boning something out at the, um, you always want to look for that joint and you can manipulate it to find the soft spot. And this is where your semi-flexible boning knife comes in handy because you can just get down in there and um, use the joint to help you. One of my favorite things is joints though, because usually when you pop something out of the joint, it's like so white. It's really beautiful, just like right where the, the bones came together. And you'll get like, sometimes you get a little fluid running out and people think like, oh God, is it rotten? It's just the joint fluid that's coming out from in between. Yay! There's the H bone. So for air drying this ham, we'll leave, here's our, Femur, yeah, I keep wanting to say humerus, but that's the shoulder. If I wanted to bone this out for like a boneless ham, I would just take and start here and I would cut atop the humerus to expose the top of it and I would just take my knife and go around it. Sometimes on, on a hog, depending on how it died or how it was killed, the humerus will be almost at a right angle to the shank bone. So that'll help you to locate it because you can just take a right angle from the shank. And this one, it's more of a 45, but, um, if I wanted to make a boneless ham, I would probably just take the shank off right here with the saw and then remove the humerus and be done with it. Tie it up. You could skin it first. You could leave the skin on and truss it. 
whatever you want, but we're going to leave it just like this. If I want to make ham, like ham sandwiches and stuff, how would I make that meat work for like ham sandwiches? What I would do is bone the whole thing out and then you can, cu you can tie it and then cut it into smaller sections, leave the skin on, brine it and smoke it. That's how they make like the hams that you're used to eating, you know. Like we do a sweet tea brine at the shop and then smoke it. We do a um, apple cider brine and then smoke it. And that's the kind of hams that people come in and buy for deli meat and stuff, you know. And they turn out real pretty too once you bone them out and roll them up and tie them and then smoke them, the skin gets really brown and they're nice and round and stick them in the slicer and make really nice clean cuts. Yeah, we usually take it off right before we slice it, but we leave it on for people to see in the case, you know. So you just, you're just just going to cure the shank and the ham together? Uh -huh. We might, yeah, yeah, I think so. Depends on what Rocco wants to do, it's his pig. How you, what would you do with it then after you've got it all? Sandwiches, charcuterie board. You really got a whole bunch of exposed meat here too that if you just you know, squared it off. Yeah. Or we could. So now you, fix you take the sirloin off. The sirloin is pretty much a triangle. You can see. I would just go right there. We should decide if we want to take the sirloin off, like Greg was saying, and just square it off before we dry it. And if we want to do that, we could just take the sirloin off now, just get a whole bunch of kosher salt, and just cover this bad boy up, stick it in the fridge. We'll be done with that part, you know? That's what uses kosher salt. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's big and fresh for us. Yeah. Is that the only reason you use kosher salt? I mean, sea salt is just so, it has so many trace minerals in it and stuff. Like, you never know if you're getting an even cure or it can, some of those minerals can turn the meat, you know? And the sea salts are just so different. Um, Don't they have curing salt? Yeah, curing salt is, when, usually when people talk about curing salt, they're talking about sodium nitrite and sodium nitrate. And there's two different ones. Cure number one, sodium nitrite. That's for like your bacon, your ham. You don't have to use it, but it's generally used. It's used in some sausages for flavoring, for coloring, for preserving. And then cure number two, sodium nitrate, is used for dried, dry cured items. So we'll put some in that capicola we're gonna make probably. Um, but you don't use that, you just use a little bit of that. Tiny bit, yeah. Whole, so the rest of it's the kosher salt. Yep, mm -hmm. and, sugar. and sugar. So we're smoking, did you rub those hams down? Ham and shoulder down? So we're smoking a um, ham and a shoulder for the dinner tomorrow, and we just rubbed it with one-to-one -one sugar and salt, kosher salt, and that's it. And we're gonna smoke it starting here pretty soon. <laughs> this is our picnic, I believe, with the country ribs removed. This is our bone-in Boston butt. This is our strip loin with the tenderloin still intact. This is the belly with the flat meat still attached. Spare ribs from the belly. Country ribs from the picnic. This is our ham with the sirloin still attached. Over here we have our skin on <laughs> humongous bone in <laughs> pork rib chops. And this is the, uh, this is a saddle belly, I guess. Yeah. That came from below the strip loin. That's the bacon. You can make more bacon out of that. That has more fat on it, you know. Um, you can certainly, it's all belly, you can make bacon out of it. If you didn't make bacon, what would you do with that? We kind of want to make chicharrones with it, but you could skin it, you could. Which, which how, do you, how do you make chicharrones? Chicharrones, what I would do is just cut that into strips. And the guy from the Dominican that taught me to make it would dust them with baking soda and then cook them like that big pan right there. I would just arrange them in there and put a lid on it and just cook it on like moderately high heat and just cook them down in their own fat. Maybe 40 minutes. It depends on how fatty they are, you know. Um, so you cook them really crispy? You're basically frying them because there's going to be so much fat in there that if it's on moderately high heat, you know, you're like slow frying them. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. That's a pretty big one right there. But I think they'll make good chicharrones because they have a little bit of meat on them. And I think the true like chicharrones actually do have, it's not just pork skin, it's got meat on it as well. Do you want me to take the tenderloin out? Sure. Um, I'm about this, uh, when you make your bacon mm -hmm. with your either brine or dry cooker, you can use more sugar to have a less salty taste. And if you use a little tablespoon of the sodium nitrate, then you're pretty assured that 
Yeah, I mean, I think you should just look up a recipe. For butchery, I would say whole beast butchery is a really good, like simple, Ryan Farr of 4505 Meats in San Francisco wrote it. And what he does that I really like is it's like a picture book. It's everything step by step. There are a few things that he glazes over. One thing he does that I like is he just chooses what to do with the animal and he just does it. And he's like, this is what we're gonna do. And he doesn't talk about the other options. So you can go through his book and learn and then you can go back and learn about anatomy and kind of start to understand how you might have done something differently. That's about my go-to when I'm like looking for ideas or I just want to see some really good pictures. Um, my book doesn't have a title yet, but it should be coming out um, earliest like fall of next year and it will deal with the whole animal from a homesteader's point of view, which is another thing. There's a book called Butchery and Sausage Making for Dummies. It's like a dummies book and it's written by Tia Harrison. She's also out in San Francisco. It's a decent book. She covers butchering on the rail, which I find really interesting because I don't think that many home practitioners are gonna be able to butcher on the rail. They're gonna be butchering on the bench. And the rail means it's hanging, especially with beef. Like that's a huge piece of meat to hang. So it seems more geared towards the commercial cutter, you know, her book does. And butchering on the rail is a different animal. It's like totally different, just the way the muscles are oriented because they're hanging up and down and you use gravity more and it's, so I can turn this around. If you can kind of see the little cavity that it sits in. And I'm just trying to skirt right behind it with my knife. One of the things about, tenderloin is not my favorite. I'm not a huge fan of tenderloin. I usually leave it in. One thing you'll find, especially with like beef and stuff, is that it oxidizes really, really fast because it's a lean piece of meat. Um, so once you get it out, it's like you gotta do something. You gotta vacuum seal, you gotta cook it. Um, one of my favorite things to do at the shop was to leave all the fat on it and really blow people's mind because people don't even think tenderloin has fat on it because they're so used to seeing those clean little medallions of filet mignon. But one, I mean, if I'm gonna do a tenderloin, there's nothing I like more than a big old long fat on tenderloin, you know, with like string tied around it. Why take the leanest, least flavorful muscle on the animal, take all the fat off? What's the point of that, you know? Like fat equals flavor. You can always take the fat off after you cook it. Uh, do you have a market for uh, roasters around here. Yeah, um, you yeah. I mean, again, you? I, you know, I mean, I'm so small. I've got my couple little chefs and my, my friends. And what do you mean when you say roasters? Like a smaller hog? Like a whole, like whole, whole, whole smaller. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah I and mean, I find that people for there's a market for that with events, <laughs> with weddings and, and stuff like that. Um, what do you know? Mean? I'm boning out the loin for a boneless pork chops, I guess, or a loin roast. And all I'm doing is undercutting it, you know, undercutting the the, t the tip of the back of the ribs that are on here. So I'll go under that and then I'll go, I'll try to go cl as close to that spine as I can, you know. Freeze them and then I might save it because I'm a little bit worried about the smoker getting started. Thanks.